If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We've uh, two sermons now into Romans. Uh, and last week we finished the second half of uh, Romans chapter 1. Uh, today I want to talk to you about God's righteous judgment. God's righteous judgment. And folks, when you hear the word judgment, it always has a negative connotation. Uh, but I'm telling you, uh, God is right in everything He does. And uh, we need to take the Word of God uh, literally. And uh, Paul here, uh, because if you think about it, he really doesn't get into salvation till the third chapter. So he's just addressing some issues, uh, obviously, that are going on in the Roman church there. And uh, a couple of these issues uh, we will share with you today. Let me give you the outline if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us. Number one, everyone will be judged by God. Okay? Everyone. You're not going to get out of it. You're not going to be late. Okay? You will be judged by God. It's just you and God. Number two, everyone will be judged by their deeds. The Bible tells us when we get saved, we need to be working for the Lord, and we will be judged by our deeds. And I'll show you that in Scripture also. And number three, everyone will be judged by God's law. I know we have a lot of laws in our government, but I am telling you, and, and those laws, if you think about it, are made to protect us, okay, to protect us. I know we don't agree with all of the laws, but here's the deal, folks. God's law never changes. God's law is what we are reading today. God's law is what we live by every day. God's law is the law that guides us. And he says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change his law. And what we have to do, and, and man has tried to change a lot of things. They've tried to get the Bibles out of, I mean, they have got them out of schools, and they've, you know, they try to keep them out of countries and all kinds of things going. But I'm telling you what, folks, God's law is uh, true. It is permanent. It is forever and ever. So in Romans chapter 2, uh, many Jews in Paul's days believed uh, the idea that performing certain moral and religious works produced righteousness. They taught that you could earn special favor of God and eternal life by keeping the Mosaic law and Jewish traditions. Some even believed if they failed in the works effort, they could, they could for, forfeit some earthly rewards but were still exempt from God's judgment simply because they were Jews, God's chosen people. And if you think about it, Jesus uh, banged heads with the scribes and the Pharisees all the time. And we'll be talking about that here in just a few minutes. They firmly believed that God would judge and condemn the pagan Gentiles because of their idolatry and immorality. We named the 24 things in chapter 1 that, that are totally against God's laws. And the Jews really thought judgment doesn't come to them because they are God's people. I got news for you folks. God has no favorites. The ground at the cross is equal. We are all the same in God's eyes. The Apostle Paul in our text deals with this very issue. We must all understand that we are all, we are all sinners and stand guilty before God. And on our own, we cannot bring ourselves to God's standards of righteousness. And folks, God sets the standard. And let me tell you what the, the standard is. It's perfection. And not one of us in there can go to God. We cannot clean up enough. We cannot be good enough to be as righteous as Almighty God. Everyone must come to Jesus through the repentance of sin, putting their trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. Only God will be the judge, and His judgment of man will be fair and impartial. So let's look at Paul's writing in this second chapter of Romans Verse 1, therefore, and also when you see therefore, you need, to, you need to know what it's there for. All right, he's talking about everything that he just talked about, 
Okay, all these things that man is doing. And folks, it was the world. It is a reflection of the world in which we live in now. You are inexcusable, all right? Oh man, whoever uh, you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And folks, that's what the Jews were doing, especially the scribes and the Pharisees. They were looking down on the Gentile uh, people. They would not have fellowship with the Gentiles. Uh, they would judge them by what they had on or if they had a copy of the law or if they knew any of the law. They were just acting like they were better than the Gentiles. And folks, we should never judge anyone. Okay, the Bible speaks of this. Hold your finger there and go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus speaks on this very issue about judging the others. And folks, we're bad about this. Many times we stereotype people. Many times we look at someone and pass a judgment automatically. I'll tell you, we all do that. A uh, couple of times since I've been here, uh, those who know me know I ride a motorcycle, and I have motorcycle gear. And every once in a while, I'll put on my motorcycle gear, and I've even preached in the old sanctuary with my uh, gear on. Uh, uh, last time, it was out when we were in the parking lot. And one lady <laughs> looked at me, not this last time, but the first time, you don't look like a preacher. Well, folks, I'm still a preacher if I'm on my bike. And, and if it's 65 degrees or more, folks, I'm looking to ride my bike. I do not change. I don't turn into, uh, you know, some Harley Hell's Angel or something. I'm always a preacher. Everywhere I go, I try to be the same. But folks, we do that. We look at people and we judge them by their appearance or what they have on or how long their hair is, how many piercings they have or how many tattoos they have. And we do it all the time. Look at verse 1, 7, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not. Folks, we could stop right there. And I thought if it would work, and I know this is what Jesus thought, I'll just say these two words and it should be plain. But he didn't stop there. Why? Because we are human. Okay, we are human. Judge not that you uh, be not judged, for with what judgment you judged, you will be judged. And folks, when we point that finger at folks, there's three fingers pointing right at us. And we should not judge people, especially by their outer appearance. And Jesus talked about the scribes and the Pharisees, and they, he, he did say, you know, y'all look all good on the outside. But folks, what really matters is what's on the inside. You may not even know that person. You may not even know the background of that person or what has happened in their life. And we do not as Christians need to judge others. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Let me give you a, a phrase that we use. What goes around comes around, folks. If we are ugly to people, folks, I'm telling you, God is not pleased. If we judge people, God is not pleased. Folks, we ought to thank God. We know God. We ought to thank God for the many blessings that is, He has given us. And we need to quit judging others. Verse 3, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? And Jesus is basically saying, even the scribes and the Pharisees, the thing that they were criticizing the Gentiles for, they were guilty of those same sins. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. I. Folks, we should not be doing that. We should not. Look what he says. Hypocrite. Folks, that's strong. That is a strong word for Jesus to use. What is a hypocrite? It's someone that pretends to be something they're not. Folks, you know, we aren't always holy. 
We don't always do the right thing. We all have issues. And what we need to do is take care of our issues and let God take care of everyone else. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So Paul is just saying, hey, listen, you guys, don't act self-righteous. Don't act religious. Don't act like you're better than someone else. Folks, we are all just sinners saved by grace. Verse 2, but we know that the judgment of God is according to the truth against who practice such things. What is the truth? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Who is the judge? It is God. Folks, we should do everything His Word says. We need to read the Bible. We need to study the Bible. We need to know what the Bible says. Listen to me. We need to treat others the way Jesus treated others. Who did he hang around with? Think about it. Tax collectors, all right? Ex-prostitutes, all right? The down and out, the people that no one else would minister to. Folks, we need to treat everyone the way Jesus would treat them. Verse 3, and do you think this, O man, who, uh, who, who judge those practicing things and do the same that you will escape the judgment of God. What is he saying? He's saying we like to point out other people's sin, but we don't sometimes even deal with our own sin. There's not a perfect person in here, folks. None. Zero. Okay? Only God is righteous. Only God is holy all the time. Only God never changes. So he's saying... You Pharisees and scribes, you are worse than them because you are pointing out their sins and it makes them feel more spiritual and even sometimes look more spiritual. And Jesus is saying, we do not need to do that. We will all be judged. Look at verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness for bearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Folks, I am telling you, the Bible tells us God is so good to us. God has so blessed us. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and we need to be sensitive to other people around us. Folks, nobody likes to be judged by somebody. Nobody likes to feel in, inferior to somebody. And we, as Christians, we need to encourage uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and we even need to encourage the sinners. We need to pray for those who don't know Christ. We need to pray for those who are lost and have not experienced what we've experienced. And folks, in this, the three things he speaks out is God's goodness, his forbearance, his mercy, his long-suffering, his patience ought to drive us to treat others the way God has treated us. So that's what the golden rule is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And folks, the Pharisees thought they were righteous, but man, Jesus got all over them saying, quit judging others. Luke chapter 5. Just look at two verses. Luke chapter 5. Luke 5. And this is after uh, he was talking to Matthew the tax collector. Look at verse 31. And Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Folks, there's people that don't, they weren't raised in Christian homes. They don't know what the Word of God says. They are just being who they are because they don't know God's Word. And, and, and the way we treat them, sometimes when we treat others that way, they may not want to come to Christ because of our attitude. Verse 32, but I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Folks, I'm telling you, let God be God. Be nice. Be kind. 
have the fruits of the Spirit in your life. So we see that everyone will be judged by God. And the second thing I want you to see is everyone will be judged by their deeds. Look at verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render uh, to each one according to his deeds. He is really getting on the scribes and the Pharisees. The hardness of their hearts means they are not sensitive to the Holy Spirit. They are judging others and, and hard at that. It, impenitent heart means stubborn. It's that stubbornness, okay, in our life. And folks, we don't need hard hearts. We don't need stubbornness. We need to be sensitive to the Spirit of God and sensitive to what God is telling us to do. And you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. They will be judged by God and will render to each according to his deeds. Folks, deeds is your works. And you have to understand, some people uh, get confused on this issue. We are saved by God's grace. Salvation is God's riches at Christ's expense. But we are judged by our deeds. By our deeds. There's, that's called the Bema Seat. And the Bible talks about that. Every Christian will go to the Bema Seat, and I'll share Scripture with you in, in just a few moments that talks about that. And so we need to understand that it is our deeds. When we get saved, God wants us to do good works. All right, we're not saved by our works. We're saved by Jesus Christ, by the blood of Jesus Christ. But we need to be doing good deeds and good works. James chapter 2 speaks of that. Hold your finger there and go to James 2 with me. James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if what someone says he has faith but does not have works? Now here's the deal, folks. Anybody can say I'm saved. You just go around asking people, and I'm telling you, nine, you know, eight out of ten people will say, well, yeah, yeah, I'm saved. Yeah, I'm going to heaven. Uh, yeah, they'll even say I'm a Christian. Okay? But are there deeds can you see Jesus Christ in them? Are they sensitive to the Holy Spirit? He says he has faith, but does not have works. Can faith save him? And then he gives an example. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? He's simply saying, and I understand Sometimes I, I, I struggle with this too. You stop at a stoplight, someone's on the corner, and they've got a sign. Folks, all I can tell you is you need to ask God, do I need to help this person? Do I need to help them? And if he says yes, roll down your window, obey God, and give him some money. But what a lot of people just say, you know, they, they just, they, they cut it off. They don't even contemplate. They don't even pray about it. They don't even think about it. Oh, that bum, he needs to get a job. Okay? And that may be the case, but we don't know that. So he's just saying, it's more than just saying, folks. It's, it's, it's doing the work of God. It's doing what Jesus would do. Folks, he loved everyone unconditionally everyone unconditionally. And it says, uh, the part in peace, uh, verse 17, excuse me, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. Folks, we know what dead means. Okay, dead means you are not alive. You have not been changed by God. It's more than just uh, you know, I, I, I know when I made one of my false professions of faith when I was a child, a guy preached on hell. I was six years old, and he literally scared me half to death. But nothing changed in my life. I got, I got baptized, 
And I thought, hey, I, I did what I was supposed to do. But deep inside, as I grew older, I realized that I really didn't get saved. I had, I, I, what I call it, I call it fire insurance. I mean, who wants to go to hell? I, I have yet to meet a man or a woman that says, I want to go to hell. Okay? And as a kid, in my mind, I did what I thought I should have done. But folks, it was just talk. Okay? I wasn't changed. I did the same thing when I was 14 years old. I was at Falls Creek. And, and on Friday night, you know, the tears and the songs and all that hugging and all that stuff going on. And I wanted to change. I knew that it wasn't real when I was six years old, but I would not let go of everything. I still wanted to do things my way. And it wasn't until I was 22 years old when I finally figured it out and the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sins and God changed me from the inside out. The Bible says, verse 18, but someone will say to you, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And folks, I'm telling you, you know, works don't get you into heaven. It doesn't. Matter of fact, my question would be, how do you know when you've done enough works? There's a lot of people that do more works than you do. And that's the same for me too. We're all in that boat. But it's not by works, folks. It's by faith. We will be judged by our deeds. Folks, our sin, let me put it another way. Our sins were judged on the cross. And He wiped our sins out as far as the east is from the west. He's not going to bring up the sins before I got saved. But He will bring up the things that I have done wrong after I got saved. You will stand before God and give an account of that. And I'll show you that Scripture in just a second. Folks, I'm telling the Jews were just looking down on the Gentiles and they were judging them. They thought that they were saved. And all they were doing was they was what I call showboating. They wore the right clothes. They said the right things. Okay? It's, it's like, you know, just because you come to church doesn't make you a Christian. All right? I mean, I'm glad you're here. I am thankful that you're here. But James and even Paul is trying to get you to understand it's not by what is seen on the outside and I'll get to this in just a second. Folks, God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart, and that is so, so important. Let's keep reading. Verse 7, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality. What is he talking about? He's talking about Christians, okay? Seeking doing good. All right, not seeking our own glory, but seeking the glory of God. Your life is a reflection of God. In honor, you are honoring your heavenly Father. You are honoring God with your life. And of course, we know immortality, we have everlasting life. Folks, the longer I live, the more I long for heaven. The longer I live, the more... I'm, I mean, there's times in my life I feel like I'm halfway there. M maybe more than halfway there. I'm just there. Verse 8, But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, ig ignition, uh, excuse me, indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. Folks, I'm just telling you, there's going to be a separation. Matthew 25 speaks of the sheep and the goats. And those who don't know Christ, the Bible says, will be cast into eternal fire. That's what Revelation 20. And if it does my heart no good to say that. It hurts my heart to know that people that may be in my family or people that I know are going to die and go to hell. That hurts my heart. And we need to be busy, folks, witnessing to these folks and tell them about Jesus. 
not beating them over the head with our Bible and preaching at them and, and being condescending in what we do. But look what he says. Uh, of the Jew first and also the Greek. Because this was the whole battle, folks, in Rome. Okay, this was the battle. It was the Jews that had acted righteous and holy when their hearts were far from God. And then there was everybody else was a Gentile, which most Jews would have nothing to do with. Verse 10, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good. God's glory, God's honor and peace. Folks, you want the peace that passes all understanding? You just invite Jesus Christ into your life. You just know that when you lay your head down on your pillow, everything is right with your soul. You just know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven, folks. That gives us peace that passes all understanding. And it says, to the Jew first, and he says it again, and to also the Greek, what he's trying to say is, folks, everyone everywhere needs Jesus Christ. Everyone. Folks, Rome was a mission field. Fort Smith is a mission field. There are still literally hundreds, if not thousands, that need to know the, uh, the Lord, need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Then verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. Folks, God is no respecters of person. Matter of fact, Second Peter says he wishes that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we see everyone will be judged by God. Everyone will be judged by their deeds. And everyone will be judged by God's law. Folks, it's the law. It's the law. It's His Word. When I say the law, and when they mention the law, He's talking about the Word of God. The Word of God judges us. Okay? It judges us. Verse 12, For as many have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and as many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. And folks, that's what He's saying. The, the people that are saved... They are judged by the law, by God's law. And then those who are not saved, they will still be judged by God's law. And we talked even last week about uh, even creation shows the glory of God. And this is what Jesus got on to the scribes and the Pharisees about. He's saying, you have the law, you know the law, and you're still not doing the right thing. But he's also saying he has put a certain amount of faith he has put a certain amount of law in everyone. See, a lost man, if I ask a lost man, do you think murder is okay? You know what their answer is. No, it's not okay. Well, how do they know that? They just know that. Is adultery okay? No, it's not okay. These things, these sins, they know that. God has put that in their life. And that's what I'm saying. He is really saying to the Jew, and, and when we think about the Jew in this text, to the Christian, you have the Word of God. You have these things. And the judgment will be harsher on you because of that. But, but the, the law, the, the laws of God, knowing that there is a Creator, knowing that there's a, a God out there, it's still in the heart of the unbeliever. Verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. And folks, we can hear something. We can sit in classes all day. We can come to church every Sunday, but that doesn't mean God changed our life. We need to hear the Word of God, and we need to obey the Word of God. We need to be closer to Christ today than we were a year ago. We've come into this new, new year and this new uh, you know, uh, time in our life, this, this time, and, and I understand it's times of struggles. I'm tired of the COVID too. I'm tired of death too. But God has left us here for a purpose. We are here for a reason, and that is to shine our lights in this dark, dark world and show them uh, Jesus Christ. Show them how Jesus lived in his life. 
Verse 14, for when Gentiles who did not have the law by nature do the things of the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. They have this nature inside them. They have this, this amount of faith. They have this thought and they have this, this uh, you know, uh, guide inside of them. Some people call it a conscience, okay? But again, folks, a conscience a lot of times has to deal with how you were raised. If you were not raised in a Christian home, you're not going to be convicted of things that other people have that were in Christians' homes. That's why we have to simply go by the Word of God. Verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else accusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to uh, my gospel. So he's basically saying no matter what, whether you were in church where you were raised, you know right from wrong. And the only one today that knows whether you are saved or not, God knows whether you're saved, and you really know whether you're saved or not. But sometimes during a time of invitation, you just push those feelings back. You just push them away. You want to you know, show somebody your baptismal certificate, or you want to show somebody your church membership. And folks, those things are good, but I got news for you. That's not what's going to get you in heaven. What's going to get you in heaven is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we all, for we must, must is no options. All appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So the Bible says we will all be judged by God. <laughs> Sometimes my wife even teases me. She just says, you know what? I'm glad Elle, her, her real name is Lorraine, is before M." because you're going to stand at that judgment seat a lot longer than I am. <laughs> and you know what? She's probably right. <laughs> but folks, I'll stay there as long as it takes, knowing I get into heaven. Folks, First John tells us these things are written that we may know that we are saved. We are know that we are saved. You need to know that. Before you leave this place, you need to know that your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We don't have time to go there, but uh, on your sheet, in your outline, Matthew 25, the sheep and the goat. Would you just read that this afternoon? Would you just start uh, in uh, verse 31 and read down through that text and see what Jesus says about that? Last one, Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12, and I'm finished. Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is living. Folks, this Bible is alive. I do not understand anyone that says the Bible is boring. It's alive, folks. It is the Word of God. It is Jesus incarnate. It's, it's God in the flesh. It is God's love letter to us. It is living. It is powerful. It will change you if you let it. It is sharper than two-edged sword. It cuts through every excuse you have. Every excuse we have for not coming to Christ, it cuts through those. And it even piercing to the division of the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, folks, that's what Jesus was trying to tell the scribes and Pharisees. He was simply saying, man, I know. I know you. I know your heart's not right. I know you're not right with God. And folks, I'm just telling you, only you can do something about that. My prayer is today, number one, that you would just listen. Listen to the voice of God. These next few minutes, listen to the voice of God. 
And then the second thing I ask you to do, obey the voice of God. Our altars are going to be open, and they're always open, folks, for people to pray. You can come down and pray any time you choose. It would not upset me if you came down while the sermon was going on. That would not upset me one bit. But we need to be right with God. Father, thank you for the day. And God, I know it's a hard thing to think about. It really is. Nobody wants to be judged. Nobody even likes to think about being judged, but we will. The fact of the matter is we will all be judged. And God, I just, uh, I just want to, uh, in Jesus' name, ask for forgiveness of my sin. God, I know I fall short many times. But God, I thank you that I know you. I thank you that you know me. And God, we're gonna, we are one day going to make all things right. So God, I pray that you would just speak to those here today, to the Christians. First, are they right with God? Are they right with their family? Are they right with their fellow man? And God, if they can't say yes, yes, and yes, God, I pray today they would do business with you. Just you and them. Just you and them. And God, to the non-believer, to those that are not sure if they died today, they would go to heaven. God, I pray your Holy Spirit would just speak to their hearts. And God, I pray they would come down. I pray they wouldn't wait. I pray they wouldn't care who's in the building or how many people are looking at them. I pray that they would literally come to Jesus. Maybe somebody needs to rededicate their life or follow the Lord in baptism. God, whatever you want, God, that's what we want. Help us to be obedient to your voice. Help us to be still and know that you are God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?